um, tutorial. Anyway, I had better work out how to share my screen again. First of all, I managed to, uh, with Daniela's help, work out how to upload my teaching materials to the appropriate place. So if you go into the Dropbox set up for this into my folder here, you will see that all of the um, tutorial um, case files here and also the tutorial files such as the um, descriptions here and my um, my slides which I've been using and in fact also if you go to the keynote speech part you'll be able to find my um, session on Bayesian optimization from yesterday so I very much hope you enjoy looking through that material. Anyway, as um, carrying on from yesterday's um, presentation, I was talking about larger dissimulation and I I've done a little bit on an LES calculation of a, the backward facing step flow and I showed you how to set up a function object to do a, a um, continuous averaging process which is one of the things we very often want to do with LES but I'd also um, put together some material on the Taylor Green Vortex and rather than just leaving this for you to look at on your own, I thought it would be a nice idea to just talk through a couple of the aspects here. And in particular, um, I thought it would be interesting to look at a couple of pieces of programming which I did to set this up. Now, I don't know if you're aware of the Taylor Green Vortex. It's a um, it's a virtual case in turbulence research. What do I mean by that? Well, it's not something you could easily set up as an experiment, but it's something which you can very easily set up as a computational exercise. And it's ev evolution, it's, um, first of all, from the starting conditions to turbulence and then the decay of that turbulence afterwards is reasonably well understood. So um, this is a picture I got from some online report um, calculated using a high order code called NEC5000, which you may have come across. Here's the initial condition and it's described by this velocity field here. So a bunch of sine and cosine functions giving you the x and the y component of the velocity. So you've got these long vortices in the, in the cell here or rather in the, in the domain here. The faces of this domain are cyclic periodic, so this is an infinite array of these vortices. And as time progresses, they interact with each other and break themselves up and form a turbulent flow, which then decays with time through, this, through the action of viscosity. So as I say, it's a well understood flow. Now, this is something which we can and ought to be able to um, simulate using OpenFOAM. And there are a number of tasks I faced when I was setting this up, one of which was to set up the initial um, flow field we're starting from. Inside a cubic domain, the standard size is 2 pi by 2 pi by 2 pi, and we can resolve this by 32 cells in each direction, and then you can move to 64 cells and 128 cells as you do mesh refinements there and of course cyclic boundary conditions there. And then there are a couple of post-processing um, steps which I want to do. And one of these is to sample the flow parameters in the domain. And the other is to calculate the total kinetic energy in the domain, because this is one of the key, the, the formation, the decay of that turbulent kinetic energy is one of the key um, parameters of the simulation there. Now, to give you some ideas of what I'm do, going to be doing here, to set up the initial vortices, I decided to write a separate small piece of code, a, a, an app you might call it, in OpenFOAM, which would do that for me. So I'll take you through how I do that. And then sampling the flow parameters, an issue of using a particular type of function object, 
And having coded, having put that together, I then wanted to analyze the total kinetic energy. Um, and this is something which I want to output every time step during my simulation. So I want to do this as part of the calculation. Now I could do that by taking, let's say, pimple foam and making my own copy of that and writing the code into that. But I decided to do it this time using a codable function object. And this is very similar to the user-defined boundary condition we looked at yesterday. So once again, if you are understanding um, C++ C++ and, C++ and open phone programming, you'll be able to follow what I'm doing here in terms of the programming steps. If you haven't got that far, looking at tomorrow's schedule, there are a couple of tutorial sessions which cover programming in open phone. So hopefully I can give you some ideas to what's going on here. And if you watch the videos tomorrow, hopefully you'll learn enough to be able to follow what I've done here. Okay, let's have a look at what we've got. First of all, um, the concept of writing a code to initialize the calculation. So what I want is a small piece of code which is going to read in the velocity field, redefine it, and then write it out again. And I've done this by copying across a basic function and changing it. Now, when you write a program in open foam, you very often copy something from the library and base it on that. So that's basically what I did. C++, so the main file I'm going to be changing here is the .c file, which contains the commands. And then open foam has a make system called wmake, which uh, it makes use of a couple of files in a directory called make, and these define what the files we're going to be manipulating actually are, and some of the options. And the main thing I've had to change here is to change where the executable ends up as foam user app bin, otherwise it would try to write this to my installation. Now let's have a look at the actual code here. And as I say, if you know open foam um, programming, you'll find this very familiar. If not, what am I doing? Well, I'm reading in my vol vector field U, which is my velocity field here. And you'll see that I'm specifying I must read this and then automatically writing it out. Then I'm doing some manipulation on the values of the vector components here. And you can see I've created uh, fields representing x, x, y, y, and z, z. And these are the x, y, and z components of my cell centers. Um, this mesh.c command says, give me the cell center vectors. So that's giving me the x, y, and z components. And then I can calculate and replace the velocity components in there. So ux is going to be some coefficient times sine x times cos y times cos z. And that's exactly what I've got here. So sine of the x component, cos of the y component, cos of the z component. Having replaced the x, the x component of the velocity, I can do the same thing for the y component of the velocity in each case. And the z component is zero. So that's what I've done there. And then I write it out there. OK, so I now need to compile this. And if I switch on open foam, I like to use do a command called wclean. First of all, that resets everything. And then we have a command called wmake, which runs the make system and compiles our code for us. So this is going to compile the file called tg initialize, and you can see that it's given me a new command here called tg initialize, which is going to set up my initial condition. Let's go to the actual case directory. Here we go, Taylor Green. And this is what I, so I'm going to start off by copying 
0.rage naught like that. So that's my starting file. I need to run block mesh. So there we go. That's created me a domain which had of, of scale. Oh, you can see that's pi there, and it's 32, uh, 32 by 32 by 32. It's a square box, and we'll see that in a minute. And just to show you at the moment, my velocity file here is zeros. So I just defined them as zeros there. But then if I now run my new program, TG image, like that, there we go, that ran and that will have changed what's in my velocity field here and you can now see I've got all the values of the velocities I was expecting. Having done that I'm now going to run the um, what I'll do is I'll run the code because it takes a little while to run this. So um, pimple foam, I'm going to use pimple foam in LES mode and it's running some dynamic code which I'll talk to you about in a minute and then having done that it's starting to run the simulation and if I can stop that briefly I've got an extra line above and beyond what we usually have which is something called ET here and that's my um, total kinetic energy so how am I getting that well this is my function object. So let's have a look at the function object system, FE solution. Nope, sorry, wrong file. Um, here we go, control dict. So my runtime functions, my function objects here. I mentioned that I've put in a some probes which I'm sampling pressure and the velocity at the center of the domain and I'm also doing a bit of averaging in order to get some average values but the main bit of the coding I've got here is this I've given it a name I'm basically writing my own um, fu um, function object here using libutility function objects as a basic point here and this enables me to add some C++ code, some open phone code which will be compiled when I start the run and then will be executed as a function object every time step which is what I'm after here. And as with the boundary condition yesterday, the basic syntax here is everything between hash bracket and hash bracket down here is code to be um, compiled and executed. And what I want to do here is to add up the grid scale kinetic energy so that's half u squared where u is the grid scale velocity and I'm also running this using the standard k equation, um, k equation LES model so I want to add on the subgrid scale k here. So once again, I've got a command here which creates now a volume scalar field and I'm calling it ET here for total energy, obviously, not nothing to do with the film. And here I'm not reading it, but I am going to write it out and I'm creating it with a value. So I'm going to create it with a half U squared plus the subgrid scale kinetic energy and this thing now one of the things about this is that I need to find this information from what's called the runtime database and so this command here look up object asks for the object from the runtime database of with the name u here so the runtime database is this big computational object which is created when we start running a calculation and contains all of the big computational objects we create. So the velocity, the pressure, all of these fields and a number of other things are all stored in this runtime database and when we're programming we can make use of that information. And um, it's associated with the mesh object so I ask the mesh object look up in the runtime time database and give me the vol vector field called U. 
Then I'm going to square that, take half of it and add on to that. Oh, by the way, I need the subgroup scale kinetic energy. So once again, I'm asking the mesh, look up for the run on the runtime database for a vol scalar field called K. And that I'm going to add on there. Having done that, that's then created my vol scalar field ET. So that's my kinetic energy at every cell in my domain. And I'm going to then average it and print out the result. Wherever you see info, that means I'm printing out something to the to the terminal window. And you'll see this is going to print out the word ET colon, the name of the time step I'm on, a couple of characters to separate it and then the average value of my kinetic energy for that particular time step. And that means, of course, that I'm now printing that out for every time step dynamically as part of the simulation as I go along. And if I wanted to, and I'll show you this in a minute, I could actually save this output to a file and do a little bit of magic uh, uh, Unix uh, Linux type commands to extract uh, ET this line from for each time it comes up into a file and then I can plot the results. And actually I've done that already. I did that earlier. Um, so I can show you the results of this. This is the data which I got out of this. This is my total kinetic energy. And I went looking for some um, for the results um, for a study here. And oops, sorry. This is actually done using code Saturn. And you'll see, particularly if I change the Let's redefine the x-axis to be a little bit shorter. There we go. Um, I think you'll see that my decay, my kinetic energy is pretty close to what they got from code Saturn. So I'm reasonably confident this is doing the right thing. Let's just have a look at some of the, the other results here. Oops, sorry. That. You'll see that that's generated um, time direct time step directories 10, 20, etc. Now, yesterday I mentioned these criteria for um, post processing turbulence. So let's have a look at them. Let's do the Q criteria actually. So Run that, there we go, and that's very quickly generated Q as a quantity in each of my time step directories. So you'll see, you'll see first of all, uh, yeah, we go. So you'll see, for, here we go, here's my instantaneous velocity. Here's an average value of the instantaneous velocity. And here's my Q value. And that's something which I can now post process to show you the vortices. So um, parafoam, let's run parafoam, just have a quick look at this. Close, read everything in like that. There's my domain. You can see I put it in wireframe, but that's um, the mesh which I'm running on here. Let's go back down to an outline there. And let's have a look now at a contour and the quantity I'm going to contour Q here. So let's take, let's try that first of all. Okay, but to wrong value. So not point, not point, it's not one let's try that those are my initial vortices i could for example plot on the surface here the velocity let's say so you can see that's my initial condition that's those are my vortices and without that that's the those are the isosurfaces of q identifying those vortices 
go back to that and I can time step through and you can see the way they interacted to form these vortex worms, these vortex structures, which are then going to decay with time to get smaller and smaller and eventually vanish. And once again, looking at this report, that's pretty much what they've got here for that. Anyway, as I said earlier, um, I've included these, this particular case as a case directory on the Dropbox link here, so you're free to play around with that. I've also included there my um, lecture slides for this tutorial case, for this tutorial session, and also a rather more detailed de description of the setup and the programming here, which is another one of the tutorial cases which I use here in Exeter. Anyway, I don't know if uh, I will stop sharing at that point, because I shouldn't take up much any more of, um, of um, uh, Daniela's time because she's got a lot to tell you about there. I will, I can quickly answer any questions if there are any, but otherwise I hope you make this very useful. I find this very useful. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Professor Gavin, for this uh, very interesting tutorial, I have to say. Uh, if there are any questions, you can please uh, type them in the Q&A uh, box and ah, shouldn't we add the turbulent kinetic energy associated with the resolved velocity fluctuations to the subgrid K contribution? Well, yes, you're right, but that's essentially what I'm doing. Um, you're, you're right in that there is often a distinction between the resolved fluctuations and the resolved flow, but in this case the resolved flow is zero because the basic structure here is a box of turbulence and it's not got any mean flow to it. So I'm able to say, right, any velocity in my domain here is going to be just the turbulence. I mean, it starts off as this um, coherent set of vortices, but very rapidly breaks down to turbulence. So that's why I was able to just use the resolved velocity. Of course, that resolved velocity just gives me the, the resolved component of the turbulence, which is why I've had to add the subgrid contribution as well. Great. Ah oh, yes, if I had, yes, I'm, uh, I want the total turbulent kinetic energy here. So that's the grid scale contribution, which is the, the half of the velocity squared, but there is also the subgrid scale contribution as I say, I think I'm running this using, um, I'll just double, double check what I'm running here. I think I'm right in saying I'm running it using, um, yes, I'm using a K, one equation, um, K with the K, K, well, I'm using K equation. So the one equation, eddy viscosity model. Um, K transport model, whatever it's called. So there is a subgrid scale turbulent kinetic energy which I can add on to the total here. If you're running something which doesn't have that, or for example, if you're running implicit LES, so no subgrid scale model at all, then you're not able to evaluate that contribution at all and you're missing out on some of it basically. Are there any other questions? No, it looks like that kinds of everything. So, yeah, you know, thank you very much for allowing me another 20 minutes to finish my um, tutorial. I hope that 